first take on this Feel Good Friday. Thank you for starting your weekend here with us. I'm Molly Care. Will Kane, the one and only Will Kane in the house. Excited. Yes, I am excited too. Filling in for Max Kellerman, who has a fight, of course, this weekend. Stephen A. in Hollywood, where he belongs. Well, actually, downtown LA. How are we doing? Good morning, Molly. How are you? Um, I have no idea how Will ended up on this show this morning. <laughs> Uh, my condolences to you in advance. It's good to see you, my brother. It's mm. good to see you. I'm glad uh, to be my here. My condolences. I'm glad my to be here. I figured, you know, between Hollywood and the East Coast, somebody ought to bring Middle America here. Oh, <laughs> buckle up, okay. people. That okay. is good. All right. I All like right. it. Let's go. Let's, let's get, go. Let's, let's go. get into it. On let's that go. note, shots already fired. <laughs> Coming up, the Cowboys and the Redskins facing off in Washington after week one losses. So which squad falls to 0-2 to start the season? The guys will discuss. And Terry Crews is here to talk some football, pick some of the best week two matchups. So that'll be fun. But you know where we're starting. A little Thursday night football. So about last night. The offseason free agent, Matt Forte. How about it? Scored three touchdowns. And Ryan Fitzpatrick finally figured out Rex Ryan's defense. Defense, leading the New York Jets to a 37-31 victory over the Bills in Orchard Park. Now, the New York Post back page paying homage to the Jets getting the best of Rex with the Rexercist. The Jets snapped their five-game losing streak to the Bills. Stephen A., I want to start with you here. What's your takeaway from last night? Well, my takeaway from last night is that originally I had the Jets making it to the playoffs, and I think they're a talented enough team to do it. Um, I think that Ryan Fitzpatrick looked like the second coming of Joe Montana. I think that Brandon Marsh, who got injured, scared the living hell out of me because that would have ruined the Jets' season, ultimately was able to come back, and it was good that he was able to do it. Both he and Eric Decker had 100-yard games, and then you look at this kid, uh, Inunua. I mean, he was really, really good. I mean, Decker had 126 receiving yards on six receptions. Brandon Marsh also had six receptions for 101 yards. Inunua really, really uh, sparked this team. Uh, he was making some key catches, particularly around the time when Brandon Marshall went out, out of the game and back to the locker room for a little while. And he ended up with 92 yards on six receptions as well. So that's 18 receptions between the three guys. Matt Forte showed that he was a considerable upgrade compared to what Chris Ivory gave you or what Bilal Powell is capable of giving you. So I was happy about that. But my ultimate, my ultimate takeaway from all of this is what it should be. It's what we should all reach a conclusion on. It's what we should all recognize, including my partner for the day, Mr. Will Cain. I am here to help him out if he's struggling to come to this conclusion. This is officially the beginning of the end for Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan is the head coach for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, no, uh, only 12% of the teams that start off 0-2 in the NFL end up making it to the playoffs. Uh, that means that in all likelihood, the Buffalo Bills are not going to make the playoffs. I know they've had some injuries, and obviously the suspension of Marcel Darius certainly didn't help because he, too, couldn't stay off the weed or whatever the hell he was on that ultimately led, led to him getting suspended. But in the end, when you look at what transpired last night, the Buffalo Bills made a couple of big plays, including Tyrod Taylor. But for the most part, he was jittery in the pocket all night long. LaShawn McCoy didn't get off all night long. And, when, and, and it's one thing for your offense to be struggling because we know that Rex Ryan has proven he's known little to nothing about offense. But defensively, it's suppo that's supposed to be his staple. That's supposed to be his signature. And the Jets did what they wanted, when they wanted, how they wanted, to whomever they pleased. When it came to Rex Ryan's defense, they had they lacked depth, uh, they lacked muscle, they lacked toughness, they got beat up last night, and they got exposed. And I think ultimately, once again, Je Rex Ryan is getting exposed as somebody who's full of bluster and loves to bloviate, signifying little to nothing. This is the beginning of the end for Rex Ryan. I think last night you saw why 2016, in all likelihood, will be the end for Rex Ryan and his head coaching career in Buffalo. You know, I knew yesterday, Molly, mm -hmm. that I was going to be on this show. So I listened. I always listened, actually. And I heard Stephen A. come out as he does, hyperbolic and strong against Rex Ryan. And I was ready to come on this show and tell him all the way he's wrong, which I will do in just a moment, Stephen A., you gotta hurry that. up. If I watched Go that ahead. game last night, I was, oh, you were so validated. And all the opinions, you just take a little bit too far. Here's the deal. Did Rex have a bad game? Yes. Was it particularly bad because his defense was bad? Yes. Is it time to sell on Rex Ryan? No. It's not time to start up the firing bandwagon for Rex Ryan yet. 
The toughest thing in life, Stephen A., is to find out what's real. The toughest thing in life is to deal with the swings of public opinion. And today, in my little lesson, you represent the swings, Stephen A. You represent the extremely, day after, overreaction swing to a bad loss by Rex Ryan. Warren Buffett got rich on this. It's called value investing, Stephen A. Find the true value. Let the public swing one way or another. When they're wrong, when they sell short too fast, like you're doing with Rex Ryan, buy. Made Warren Buffett a billionaire. Here's Rex Ryan. He's a great coach. Great's a small overstatement. He's a very good coach. Players want to play for Rex Ryan. Rex Ryan has been afflicted with one thing. We always think these guys are geniuses. It's funny how you're a genius when you have Tom Brady. It's funny how you're a genius when you have Joe Montana. It's funny how you're not a genius when you're stuck with Ryan Tannehill. This is who Rex Ryan has had. He has had Tyrod Taylor, E.J. Manuel, Geno Smith, Michael Vick, Mark Sanchez, Greg McElroy, and Kellen Clemens. That is who he's attempted to prove to you over the last, what has it been, 10 years, that he is a great coach. He's been saddled with these quarterbacks. He is not someone who should be on the firing line just yet. By the way, his career coaching record, there's about nine active coaches in the range of Rex Ryan, right around 500. Are they all, is it time for all of them to go, Stephen A? Is it time for Jason Garrett to go? Is it time for Jack Del Rio to go, despite winning his first game? This is two games in a 16-game season. Let Rex play this season out. I will imagine at the end, he'll end up where he usually does, 9-7, and 8-8, eight and 7-9, eight, and, and two years into a project. You can't cut bait two years into a project. Well, first of all, you better stick to politics if you're thinking about coming up against me on it, because this sports stuff ain't working out for you. You done started <laughs> off on the wrong foot. First of all, I've been an advocate of getting rid of Jason Garrett. Jack Del Rio, I was never a fan of him getting the Oakland Raiders job. Don't even get me started with Marvin Lewis, who's been in the playoffs seven years out of his 13-year career because he hasn't won a playoff game that entire period of time. There's a myriad of individuals that I have said don't belong in the head coaching spot. Evidently, as much as you say you watch this show, evidently you do not, not nearly as much much as you should or you watch but you ain't listening so allow me to force you to listen to me now since you're sitting I'm right here. across from I'm me here. at least digitally speaking I'm let's here. go to rex ryan your definition i'm glad you corrected yourself because you caught yourself when you uttered the word great because i was about to have security remove you just throw you off the set <laughs> and tell you never to come back the first thing that'd be the best thing to happen you today that'd be the best thing to happen you today Hold it this way, because you were about to say Rex Ryan was great, but you caught yourself. So I'm glad, I'm proud of you that you caught yourself with that one. But let's also get down to this. Rex Ryan, eight full years as a coach in the NFL. His record is 54 and 60. 54 and 60. That's 47% of the time he has won games. That's not great. That's not even good. That's tempering towards mediocre. I'm what happens fact, when you have Geno Smith? Is, hold on. It literally is mediocre. When you bring up the bevy of mediocre quarterbacks he played for, that didn't stop him from bloviating about how they would win the Super Bowl. It didn't stop him from bloviating about how they would contend. It didn't stop him from literally doing it when he guided the Jets to two straight and AFC Championship game appearances. But what has he done since that time, Will Kane? Because I saw how you left that out. Beautifully slick on your part because people who don't know what the hell they're talking about would have missed that. But you're dealing with me. You, you, you should have asked somebody. Let's go down the list right here, Will Kane. 2011, 8-8. Eight and eight. 2012, 6-10. 2013, 8-8. Eight and eight. 2014, 4-12. 2015, last year. Eight and eight. So the best Rex Ryan has done since 2010 is eight and eight three times. If that is not the epitome of mediocrity, I don't know what is. So when you bring up the great Warren Buffett, the Oracle, the true Oracle, as they say, understand why they call him the Oracle, which is something you should know better than me, being the pure capitalist that you are. The man is brilliant. He's not just brilliant in what he does in terms of result. He's brilliant in his prognostications. Rex Ryan has been brilliant in nothing, and that is the reality of the situation. He has not been brilliant with his prognostications. He has not been brilliant with his results. A matter of fact, not only has he not been brilliant, he hasn't been excellent, he hasn't been good, he hasn't been average, he has been below, which runs towards the forms of mediocrity. That's what we're talking about here. So you sitting on here on national television trying to come to the defense of Rex Ryan, I would say to you, my brother from another mother, from the South, you being the right winger that you are, I'm what here for you, my brother. I am here for you because clearly you don't know what you're talking about when it comes to Rex Ryan. Careful, you careful. Don't All right, now, now time for the rebuttal. You get to dance sure. in the middle of the ring, now I come out and start swinging too. It's not a victory okay. just because you're dancing. It's a victory right. at the end of the, the, the battle. Well, I've been dancing and I'm, hitting. 
You've been dancing for years, but I'm here. Hit it. Here's, Hit here's, it. here's what I'm defending. Not Rex Ryan. I'm defending reality. I'm pushing back against hyperbole. I'm pushing back against someone that calls reality. Ryan Fitzpatrick the second coming of Joe Montana. That's what I'm pushing back on. The same guy that says Ryan Fitzpatrick. Let's just indulge that moment for just a second if we can. Ryan Fitzpatrick, the second coming of Joe Montana is ready to fire not just Rex Ryan, but nine coaches across the NFL. Now, forgive me here, but that seems to me a little bit like an overreaction. That seems to me like firing a third of the league every year could be a guy who opens himself up to being wrong and value, real value, being someone there. I see you waving just one second. I see you over there. I see you waving one second. And that's what you've opened yourself up to. A guy in the, he's not even in a full second year. He's had one, two games out of his first season with the Jets. Eight and eight the first season. Yes, he's lost the first two. Let me just tell you this. You're right. He hasn't been great. I did catch myself there. But you know what you could say? Winning, going mediocre, going 500 with Geno Smith and Mark Sanchez and EJ Manuel and Tyrod Taylor, that's pretty above average. I'd like to see you. I'd like to see Jeff Fisher. I'd like to see Jason Garrett go 500 with those quarterbacks. The only point I'm making is you've gone over the cliff. You're ready for Rex Ryan to go. And I'm telling you, you're leaving value on the table. He's still a good coach. Ask anybody who's coaching. He, this guy can coach. Um, first of all, I want to reiterate my point about you being in the wrong profession, how politics is definitely your thing, because here's why. You committed a faux pas, but politicians do it every day. I'm not a politician. What they do, let me explain. What they do is they misquote and they misrepresent your position. You tried to get away with that. This is not a speech on the campaign trail. This is a debate, which means I'm right in front of you to respond to that. You said, I said, Fitzpatrick is the second coming of uh, Joe Montana. Looks like. I did not You're say, right. You said I, looks like. I did not say that. I said he was made to look that way by Rex Ryan's defense last night. You see the difference? It's not what you said. It's what I said. Now let's get to the other point. When you talk about Ryan Fitzpatrick and the New York Jets and you want to juxtapose that to what Rex Ryan had to work with, this Bills offense with Tyrod Taylor running it last year, with LaShawn McCoy in the backfield, with Sammy Watkins as one of the receivers last year, with that offensive line that you took care of by re-signing Cordy Glenn and uh, Richie Incognito, these boys were all on the field last night. And they look like a shell of themselves. But more importantly than anything else, you make the statement that when it comes to Rex Ryan, everybody who's played for him and people in the league respect him because he's a great head coach. That's actually factually incorrect. What they say about Rex Ryan is that he's an elite defensive coach, which means that he's a coordinator disguised as a head coach who needs to go back to being a coordinator. I'd hire Rex Ryan any day of the week as a defensive coordinator for my team. He deserves that. Not so much his brother, because we know how it's looked in New Orleans, and the fact that you engaged in nepotism by bringing your brother to Buffalo as if he was supposed to help and then get shellacked by the New York Jets just last night doesn't bode well for his brother. But that's a different subject for another day. In the end, what it comes down to is that Rex Ryan is an individual that knows a thing or two about defense. So, Will Kane, mm -hmm. if your strength is in a particular area, let's just say, for example, with Will Kane, it's money. It's money management. No, no, no. But then no, you no, follow just, for bank fill rookie the blank. Just real quick, I'm oh, fill Do the you blank. not need to be fired? I'm going to fill in the blank. Will Kane's sure. expertise? It's debating you. It's this. It's debate. <laughs> now that's funny. I, I appreciate don't care the how many joke. Times you I appreciate I'm the, the wrong joke. Field. I mean, I'm very touched. I don't care. I'm very touched. It's hilarious. I'll be here. But I'm going to ask you again. Seriously speaking, the strength of you, whoever you are, whatever, whatever coattails you rode to get to a particular point of elevation in your life, if you fail at that, are you useful? Drex Ryan, his signature's defense, and his defense looks suspect. And the offense don't look much better, and you don't expect anything from, from offense. So what purpose does he serve as a head coach? When the Buffalo Bills miss the playoffs this year, you going to tell me he deserves to come back and be the head coach again when yes. it would have been the sixth straight year that he's missed the playoffs? Yes. Really? Yes. Now, let me tell you one last thing. We're going to move on because I've got other debates this morning i got to beat you on. This is just the beginning of our day. I'm still waiting for you to make a good point, but go <laughs> ahead. Go I'm going to be here. I don't need you to tell me if I'm good at this. I know I'm good at this. And Rex Ryan can coach just like I can debate.
It's going to keep happening. I appreciate happening. the confidence. And let me tell you something. I respect you. I appreciate the confidence. And you caught me on a couple things. I'm going to give you that. The whole, I, did, I did push your Joe Montana you thing into hyperbole less? a little bit. Come a little now. bit I pushed it. Come on but, you have, but, but, but you're the king. You're the king of hyperbole. And today you're ready to fire Rex Ryan. I'm the king of a lot of things. And that's what I'm a winner. <laughs> all right. Let's you know? leave it there, winner. Risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. I'm going to tie it all together with a Warren Buffett quote. And that's what it looked like with Rex playing man all night, allowing nearly 500 yards with that defense. Moving on, though, the haters came out strong after A.J. Green got the best of Darrell Revis in week one. Then last night, Revis got beat bad by an Olympic long jumper, Marquis. He's Goodwin for an 84-yard TD. J.R. Smith had this to say on Twitter. Damn, Revis Island turning into a tourist resort. Just saying. Stephen A., you were still hanging in with Revis after week one, saying that he's not done. After last night's performance, seeing him get embarrassed in that drive, did that change your mind? No, it does not. I will acknowledge that it did give me cause to pause in all seriousness. I mean, we, we're sitting up here, we're debating, and that's what we're going to do based on our points of views. Uh, but in all seriousness about Darrell Revis, uh, it did give me cause to pause. When I saw him get burned like that, um, I saw a guy that's lost confidence. I saw a guy that's shaking his head. Uh, I saw a guy that, that looks like Father Time has creeped up on him. I saw all of those things. And when I saw that play, I was like, my God, because I was flying here from L.A., and, and luckily, I was on a plane where, where they had live television. And I literally could watch the whole game on TV while I was in the air. And I, I got to tell you, I was stunned. It's one thing for A.J. Green to light you up. It's another, it's another thing for, well, for Marquise Goodwin to do it. I mean, come on now. I'm not saying he can't play, and we all know that he's a speedster. But, I mean, he blew right by Darrell Revis and literally made Darrell Revis look old. But if you take away... That one reception for 84 yards, you got to ask yourself, what did Marquise Goodwin do the rest of the game? And it was pretty close to nothing. And so I think when you look at it from that perspective, you got to take into account the resume of Darrell Revis. The fact that it wasn't just his strength, his skill, his athleticism, his youth that he relied upon. Primarily, it's his brain. He's very cerebral in his approach. He's one of the most intelligent football players you'll find. And he figures out a way to get the better of you. In two weeks' time, we saw him get scorched the entire game against Cincinnati. We saw him get scorched on one play, albeit a very, very big one, against Buffalo last night. But with a guy like Darrell Revis, I don't think you look at him. It might be time, Will, to move him to free safety. It might be time. But I think his resume mandates that he's earned the right to play a few more games showing you what he can do once he gets his bearings under him. Remember that collective bargaining rules have changed, the amount of practice time you're allowed to have, the amount of work you're allowed to put in, the amount of drills you're allowed to endure, et cetera, et cetera. These guys have told me that it takes them a few weeks to get into the throes of action compared to what it used to be before these new rules and these new restrictions for player in, in activity, physically that is, to come into the equation. So taking that into consideration, I'm simply making the argument that he's Darrell Revis and he needs to be given the chance over the course of the next few weeks to get his wheels under him correctly well, and figure things out before we're willing to throw him into the cough. Well, the Jets, the problem is the Jets may not have that time to watch Revis get burned for 70-yard touchdowns over every week. That okay. time is running short for the Jets because as great as they looked last night, they almost lost to this Bills team you spent the first 10 minutes excoriating. They almost lost to those Bills because of Revis's play. The thing is, when things go bad, Stephen A., they go bad fast. That's generally how it works in life. Fruit turns fast. I had a dog, a beautiful Doberman Pinscher. Never spent a dollar on that dog in veterinary bills for the first 12 years. In the last six months, I spent thousands. Revis, like every other athlete, when he goes bad, it's going to happen fast. And if two games into the season, it's, look like, it's looking like it's happening now. So playing him at corner for the next three or four weeks could be very costly to the New York Jets. That might be time to move, might be right upon us. It happens to everybody. It doesn't mean his playing days are over. It doesn't mean he's no good anymore. It means he has to play differently. You brought it up. He has to be more cerebral or, like Charles Woodson, move into the safety position. Just scheme. You used to, you could put Revis back there. 
for the past 10 years and have him take away the best receiver on the field. It's just that those days might be gone. Not that Rivas can't play corner in a certain scheme in the NFL or can't play safety in the NFL. But I think we've arrived at this moment because it's going to go south really fast if we're here. Well, first of all, I'm sure the world appreciates your relationship with your doggy. I'm, I myself, I myself. <laughs> yeah, what's his very, name? Very, very touched. Leon. Very, I'm very, sorry. Very, I'm sorry very about touched Leon. By that. Named after Leon I mean, with the, the, He's the fact, a Doberman, the fact that, Stephen A. Don't the, forget. The fact, the fact that you spent thousands upon thousands of dollars. <laughs> Acupuncture, uh, you know, on your doggy. You I'm, I'm, we're well, so touched dad. by that. I'm sure he's worthy. Or she, is it a he or she? He. I'm, uh, he. Well, he. he. I'm sure he's worthy. Now back to football. This guy, Goodwin, 112 yards on two receptions. That means after the 84-yard catch, what we have is a situation where this guy had, what was it, one reception for 28 yards? That's it the rest of the way. And so when I look at it from that perspective, I'm saying, excuse me, you know, and, and that's and that's probably when when, when the Jets try, were trying to prevent things, and Z Revis at one time was in zone coverage. So when you look at it from that perspective, I'm just, I, 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 again, the jury is still out. He made a mistake. He got burned. Got burned badly. Looked bad. But from that moment forward, what happened? What did they do? Now I'm looking at the Jets schedule. You got Kansas City. That's Jeremy Macklin. You got Seattle. Okay, that's Baldwin and the crew coming up. Then you got Pittsburgh. Antonio Brown, mm -hmm. October 9th. Now, that I want to see. I, I want to see. That might be, Will, when we find out if Revis is done well, being Revis. I love Marquise Goodwin. I don't know if it's going to happen before that. I love Marquise Goodwin. He's a good longhorn, and he's almost an Olympian-level sprinter, but he's still Marquise Goodwin. So if the evidence right now says, suggests Marquise Goodwin's blowing by you, Boy, you better be nervous about Antonio Brown. Boy, you better be nervous about Jarvis Landry. Boy, you better be nervous about everybody coming to town. Because Marquise Goodwin, as much as I like him, he's not that level. But again, what I'm saying is you could have slept on somebody. There's a difference between getting scorched the way that you did by A.J. Green. A.J. Green had 12 receptions for 180 yards. 10 for 150 were directly against Revis. In this particular instance, the guy got you on a play. It's a big play. But you might have slept on him. You might have slept on him. And because of that, you made a mistake. What did you do thereafter? So what I'm saying is I got to watch him against these other guys. There's no question about that. But I do believe the jury is still out. I think it's finished on Rex because Buffalo ain't going nowhere. I don't think it's finished on Revis because I think Revis is going to have a lot of opportunities to prove that he's still Revis. We shall see. We shall. In the eyes of Will Kane, it's all over, though. Well, FedEx Field Sunday. It's going down. The Redskins and the Cowboys both lost their season openers. Washington is favored by three and looking for its first home win against the Cowboys since 2012. The team split their meetings last season with the road team winning each time. And we all know eyes will be on Josh Norman, hopefully, versus Des Bryant. Des calling for the matchup. Will Kane, who you got? I'm just going to be a strict... Uh rational analyst here. I got the mm. Cowboys. I mean, there's no fandom coming through here. But I will say, I've been waiting for this moment. I've been waiting to push I, I, back I, on sorry. the nonsense I, that goes Will, I'm sorry. on. Will, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry uh -huh. to interrupt. I bet you I are. Just, I, 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 I'm, I swear I am in this particular. I really am. I didn't hear you correctly. Did you say you're sorry to admit that, that, you, that, that, is, that you're picking the Cowboys, that you have no interest here whatsoever, Mr. Texas? I is that what you just said? I can separate it. Oh, I'll let you know. Lying. I'll let you know. How about this? I'll let you know when oh, I'm just please. being right and when I'm being a fan. Right now, I'm going to start off just being right. No, no. Let me get a little fan stuff out of the way. Somebody needed to come in here and push back on the nonsense that you've been saying regarding the Cowboys for, I don't know, years now. The years of pollution you've put into this Cowboy fan base needed a little fan pushback. So I'm happy to be here to do that. To just push back a tad bit. And I'm sure, by the way, you're not going to carry that nonsense into picking the Redskins in this game. That would be that would be emotional. That wouldn't be a fan. That would be hater. But we'll see. We'll see when we get there. Now, now I'm just going to start being right. Now I'm going to set my fandom aside. I'm just going to be right. The Cowboys are a near lock to beat the Redskins. You know why? A lock. <laughs> you know why? Because of your favorite team. They're a lock. So, when he does this, by the way, I always wonder, is that a real laugh or is that, is that a fake laugh? <laughs> 
Hold on. You you just mentioned the Cowboys and a lock in the same sentence. Is, did, did, did I hear you correctly? Mm-hmm. Say, say it again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, did, 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 is that what you just said? I'm gonna I'm gonna let you hear it. The Cowboys <laughs> are a near lock this weekend. Oh, near near lock. Well, I like oh to give myself God. a little room. Ahead, yeah. I'm sorry. I apologize. I apologize. I'm sorry to interrupt. Now, Take the floor. Yeah. Take the floor. Let me, let, let me drink my coffee. Go ahead. Go I've ahead, seen man. that move. I've seen that move. The coffee move. <laughs> here's the, here's the rational, lock. here's the cold, hard, rational reason the Cowboys are near luck. It's because of your team. It's because, or one of your teams, you've got like five. So it's oh, well. It's because <laughs> of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The formula to beat the Redskins was laid bare by the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Dallas Cowboys can do the exact same thing. Run that ball over and over. D'Angelo Williams, 143 yards, 5.5 yards per carry. Then Big Ben hitting Antonio Brown. Just substitute Ezekiel Elliott and Des Bryant into those names, and you've got the same game. A little tighter. I'm willing to be rational enough to say a little tighter, not quite the blowout, that the Steelers skins were, but something like 28-21 Cowboys. The Cowboys have the formula. It fits their personnel. The way the Steelers beat the skins will be the same way the Cowboys do, by running the ball with Ezekiel, who, by the way, you've also been entirely too hard on based upon one game. He will come out. He will have over 100. He will teach the entire league why the Cowboys drafted him fourth. And finally, we will see Des Bryant get the ball fed to him. We will see the ball forced to Des Bryant. Because a forced ball to Des Bryant is a forced completion. Eight times out of ten. Throw it up to Des. He'll come down. I don't care if Josh Norman's on him. I don't care if Rashard Breeland's on him. I don't care who's on him. The Cowboys know what they did wrong against the Giants. They can do it better against the Skins. A much weaker team. Much weaker against the run than the Giants. One that's laid out. The Cowboys win. Go back to the part, because I feel like laughing again. Well, go back to the part where you said that, that, that you know, you're going to speak as a fan because I'm entirely too hard on the Cowboys. Did, is that, were those your words? Was those your words? Yeah, that was where I started. But don't forget the part where I moved to just being right after that. Okay, just being right. So I'm hard on the Cowboys. Yeah. I'm hard, part of your I'm hard, on, a, I'm hard on a franchise that, that bloviates about being about the red, white, blue, about being America's team, Mm -hmm. representing the United States of America, which is supposed to be the greatest country in the world, because I've heard Will uh, in in the political stratosphere speaking about the greatness of America and all that we are and all that we represent on many occasions. But your team is a walking piece of mediocrity who hasn't won a championship in 20 years, plus who's won two playoff games in that span. Who had the temerity, the unmitigated goal to give over $100 million to a dude that at the time had won one playoff game? By the way, Will, I don't know mm-hmm. if you know this because I got to check. I mean, because again, this, this isn't politics. This is, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is sports. I know sometimes we get confused as to whether or not we're CNN or MSNBC with, 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 with how we can be at times. But here's the deal what amazes, what amazes me is that when we talk about football, Will, I don't know if you knew this. You actually have to win three playoff games in one year to win the Super Bowl. A minimum of three games, two playoff games and a Super Bowl championship. And if you're a wild card or or got to play that wild card game, you got to win three games in the playoffs and and, and then go to the Super Bowl and win that game. The Dallas Cowboys have won two games in the playoff season in more than 20 years. So there is nothing great about them. There is nothing that you should hang your hat on about them. I saw that Jerry Jones is being nominated for the Hall of Fame. I think he deserves it because he's a hype machine personified. They're worth more than $4.2 billion. They deserve credit for that, but that's about it. Now let's get to uh, to Sunday's game. Redskins going to win this game. Redskins going to win this game. Why? Because when I think about Dak Prescott, I like him. I like him a lot. But I'm thinking about a dude in his second year. This game is on the road at the Redskins. You got a guy that's going to be reluctant to throw outside the numbers because they're going to keep the game plan relatively conventional because that's just what the Dallas Cowboys do. We're talking about Jason Garrett here. Chan Gillis is going to have something to do with that. We're talking about Jason Garrett here, so we can't expect anything too innovative in that regard. We know the offensive line is is stud-like, but at the same time, you got on me for getting on Ezekiel Elliott. Well, listen, I know it's only one game and he's a rookie, and I expect him to have a very bright career. I got on him for saying he had an average performance when he lied to the American public because there was nothing average about 20 rushes for 51 yards behind that offensive line. 
Now let's get to the Redskins. I think Josh Norman should want Des Bryant. I think we should see Josh Norman on Des Bryant. I don't want to hear this nonsense coming from the defensive coordinator in Washington, Joe Barry, talking about how, you know what, hey, we got a scheme and we don't want to compromise anything because it's not about Josh Norman. It's about the other parts that would have to play different positions, have to move around, and it could, it could confuse things. You've got Jason Witten, who was targeted 12 times. You've got Cole Beasley, who was targeted 14 times. And you have a rookie quarterback and a rookie running back, even though Alfred Morris was the guy for you in the second half, as opposed to Ezekiel Elliott. That shouldn't be the Redskins this Sunday at FedEx Field outside the nation's capital if the Redskins are what they say they are, if they are not fraudulent. I don't believe they're fraudulent. I just believe they ran into a Pittsburgh Steelers team that is a juggernaut. And we will never confuse the Dallas Cowboys for being a juggernaut. I guess so I, I am not concerned. I am not worried. I think it's going to be a hard-fought contest. But I'm picking the Redskins to win this game 27-23. I'm glad we finally got around to it. It's a nonsense prediction. By the way, I guess I am confused. I thought we were debating who's going to win this game, not who's going to win the Super Bowl. I don't know why you have to bring 20 years of yes, I can be rational, mediocrity into this. We're not talking about the Cowboys May winning the Super question? Bowl. No, first you need one more rebuttal. The Cowboys, sure. despite all that, 20 years of mediocrity, do have the most Super Bowl appearances tied with the Pittsburgh Steelers of any NFL franchise. They do have Well, I mean, the back then, Will, Super my hairline was here. I mean, damn. We talking, I mean, we talking about a long I'm gonna time let you ago, talk bro. We go there. I mean, I, I'm trying to tell you right now, you, you might have thought I was wearing a toupee compared to where I had the way my hair looks now the last time the Dallas Cowboys were relevant. That don't see, count. The guilty, we understand it. See, look, but I mean, my God, over 20 years? See, over you're, 20 you're, years? You know, your fault, it's short-term thinking. And before you jump on it and say 20 years short-term thinking, you're right. The Dallas Cowboys are a good proxy for America. There are hard times. There are problems. We commit a few sins here and there. But ultimately, as you so eloquently pointed out, that I have pointed out, America at its core is a great nation. And the Cowboys at their core are a great symbol. They are what's How? great about oh, football. How? Eight How Super could Bowl you appearances, say that? Five Super Bowl victories. How could you say that? America's team Cowboys, quarterback after to, quarterback you, after listen, quarterback. Listen, 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 listen. I've heard you on many occasions. And as bright as you are, I do occasionally associate the word delusional with you. That makes sense, you being a cowboy lover, because they have the most delusional fan base in American history. They are an atrocity as a fan base. I can't you know stand them the because the fans will... Listen, listen to what you're saying They're trying here. to you wrap me, and I'm not letting this go. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sorry. letting no, this no. go. I don't you're care how guess. many times you tell you're me it's time to go. Whoa. No, you're a guest. <laughs> go ahead. I apologize. You're a guest, so go ahead and make your point. Because you I am respectful to my guest, even when they don't deserve it. Go ahead. Hey, you made me forget what I was going to say. After all that bluster, I forgot what I was going to say. No, I know what I'm going to say. Here's the, here's the nuts and bolts of it. The Cowboys dominated that game against the Giants. They dominated everything but the scoreboard. They didn't kick three field goals inside the red zone. They win that game going away. They dominated time of possession. They dominated third down conversions with 10. The only thing that went wrong for the Cowboys, besides a porous defense that doesn't have to be on the field that often, is converting field goals into touchdowns. They can do that against the skins. They will do that against the skins. They can do that the against the skins. <laughs> you go ahead, you cheerleader. You go ahead, And you know man. the only thing more delusional than a fan? You know the only thing more delusional than a fan? What? A hater. Mm. Oh, listen. A hater. Uh, Molly, right. we have to go. Molly, I'm yeah. aware that we have to go. All yeah. I want to say is this. Okay. He said, he said, don't bring up the last 20 years. Bring up recently. What were the Dallas Cowboys record last year? I don't That's think you. I, I don't think you want to bring up Enough's either. Matt Castle, All right, so please. Stephen A is going with the Redskins. That is not one of his five teams. That was pretty good earlier. Will I'll give you that. Um, Will going with Big D. Who do you think wins on Sunday? Go on Twitter now. Vote. We'll reveal those results a little later in the show. <laughs> you shine in many moments, including on the big screen. Joining us now, the very talented and funny Terry Crews. What does Thank he you want? so much for being what here. What does he want? What? What does what? he want? Wait, man, why you always, why you always got to show off, man? I mean, just be, yeah, everybody can't be built. Like right 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 What'd you say? What'd you say? I'm sorry, I'm busy showing off. What did you say? <laughs> the, the pets are popping as we speak. Let me tell you something. I'm 48 years old. 48 years young. Yes. And my thing is, hey, man, I can take it off. I'm gonna take it off till while it still looks good. You know what I mean? I'm trying to show you. that you know all the ex-ball players, the whole thing. You ain't ever gotta stop. You ain't never, never have to stop.
I'm going to keep it going. No question. You haven't stopped. But I do want to talk about, we'll talk about Brooklyn Nine-Nine after your show, but we want to talk about your first career, yeah. which was uh, playing in the NFL. You were drafted by the L.A. Rams in the 90s. What's it like having football now back in your city in L.A.? Wow. You know, it was so strange because, I, you know, Everybody, it's wild. When you leave the NFL, there's a love-hate relationship because you never leave the way you want to. Of you know, course. it's either you're injured or you get cut or they make you get out. You know, they make you retire. I mean, very few even do that. Um, so when I left the Rams, I remember leaving L.A. and disappointment and, heart, and heartbreak and the whole thing. I had to play with a couple more teams. But the fact is, now that they're back and you see it again and you're like, the old feelings just came back. And, the, you know, it was like, wow. But then I also remembered that when we were there, they hated us. It was no, it, the bandwagon was off. I mean, everything was Lakers yep. and nothing else. Literally. I mean, we were kind of, well, I remember trying to get in a club and it was like, Because L.A., oh, it's only Rams. if you're winning, right? Well, right. You, don't, yes. you, you, don't, you, you, you don't have to worry about that for the immediate future. I can tell you that much. You don't have to worry about the Lakers in that regard. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> I, 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 I will ask you this question. Okay. I've been trying to tell people that there's a window of opportunity here, but the Los Angeles Rams are in danger of messing it up. De Jeff Fisher is in his 22nd season as a head coach. Mm -hmm. Only six times have his team has his team made the playoffs. This guy is just, I mean, record-wise, it just reeks of ineptitude. How much of a window of opportunity do you think Los Angeles are going to give Jeff Fisher before they turn on him, if not the franchise, considering the way they looked Monday night against San Francisco. You know, mm -hmm. L.A. ain't tolerating that. There's a lot to do. No, one season. One season. I, this, is, this is, you know, you got to understand, that's like me going shirtless in, in a, softball, a, a softball game and then whipping out. You know what I mean? It was the same thing. You take me off the mound. You take me out of the, out of the play, the whole deal. You only have one season because L.A. is not the market you have time to develop. You see all the hype they were given? Covers of this magazine, covers of that magazine, uh, the, the, the whole, um, you know, HBO series, the whole deal, and then nothing? You can't have that in L.A. L.A. is not putting up with that. That's, there's too many other distractions, too many other things. Molly pointed out you played for the Rams, 91. Wasn't your defensive coordinator, Jeff Fisher? Jeff Fisher was my defensive coordinator, the whole thing. And, so, uh, tell me about him. Time for him to go? No, Good coach? No, no, no. Listen, I love Jeff. I love Jeff, the whole deal. But a lot of times, it's, it's, it's really out of his control right now. You're talking about a team that was in St. Louis literally a couple months ago. You know, sports teams are about confidence, history. Uh, you have to have some sort of schedule. These guys are all over the place. They don't know where they're living. You know what I mean? These guys have to uproot, get over here, let's go, put on the Settle. uniform. It's kind of like, you know, it's basically a, uh, a wrestling match where you, you know, you're know you moving your trucks from one stadium to the next, and no one has any semblance of stability. Ter and that's what a team needs. Ter Terry Crews, you think I'm going to let you sit on this, show, on this show on national television and get away with what you just said? Well, I understand that <laughs> about this season. I specifically prefaced my comments by saying... This man is in his 22nd season as a head coach, and only six times he's been in the playoffs. Now, if you don't, if, what you gonna say to that? What wow. you gonna say? Wow. Um, well, you like I said, well, I well, said well, they well, gave well. him one season, one season. But you also said that it's, it's unfair, all the moving trucks and and playing no, without I, continuity. Well, you, listen, so, so is that one season unfair? Should well, he get more? Nothing is. You can't. It's all a bunch of different reasons. You can't really place. You know, say you know, it's all this or all that. Jeff Fisher has got a shot. He's got his shot. But I'm telling you, L.A. is not going to put up with it. If he does not win, he will be gone. I know it. Fair I, weather I, I fans, it. yeah. Fair weather, the bandwagon is crazy. It's, it's just look at what's going to happen to the Lakers in the next few years. It's, it's, no one's well, going to be at Staples Center. Let me, let, me, let me transfer this. Listen, look, I, 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 you know, I, I, I've, I've known you for years. I, I got nothing but love for you, bro. And I'm, pr I'm proud of the work that you've been doing, game shows, movies, television. I mean, you're the man. But let me ask you this question. I mean, because I, I'm an Expendables dude, man. <laughs> I, I don't know if people realize how good the Expendable movies were. Yes. I mean, with you and Sly, and Sly Stallone and, and Dolph Lundgren and Jet Li. And the, I, I mean, I'm an Expendable. <laughs> Jason Stratham in the crew. I'm yes. an Expendables. Expendables kind of dude. Are they coming out with another one? Are they coming out with another one? No. No. That's oh, it. I have to say. Really? No, they're not. They're not. Sly, again, man, Sly is, is moved on. And, and I, I, I think he should. You know, the, the man, you know, was nominated for an Oscar. And I think we've done enough with the franchise, you know, 
they were looking for guys to bring in, like, you know, you know, they were really reaching for the fringes. I think we need to leave it, you know, uh, on, on its winning kind of deal right there. That's I mean, fair. we go into That's four fair. and it starts reaching for stars that ain't that much, you know, everything's like, eh. Well, you know, I Stephen guess. A makes a habit of being wrong, especially on this show, so he's not, he's going to be <laughs> wrong on your, he knows your best he movie knows as well. Is not from the Expendables. It's yeah. idiocracy. Hey, yo, dude. It's pre President Camacho. So here's my question. Go ahead. Longest yard, draft day, idiocracy. Which one's the closest to true life? <laughs> oh, 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 uh, uh, I got to go with longest yard. Longest Come on. Yard. We're living idiocracy. Yeah, I know. No. <laughs> uh, first of all, I don't even want to touch politics right now because <laughs> it's too crazy. <laughs> Uh, I don't blame you. Yeah, I don't blame you. I really. Uh, my thing is with True Life, all them brothers in jail. Yeah, Longest Yard is the one that hits True Life. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, I, I really, I, when I look at this whole thing, my career has been uh, kind of like people have their favorite things. You know, it's kind of wild. I go to church. Everybody loves. Everybody hates Chris. I go to sporting events. They love Expendables, The Longest Yard. I go to a comedy club. They love Idiocracy and, or in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. So one of my big things is always being all things to all people. And you got to understand, I made the transition. I made the transition. Coming out of the NFL is one of the hardest things to do as an athlete. It, because the NFL, they don't want to see you. You have a helmet on the whole time. Everybody is trying to get recognized so that they can do, do something with the fame or do something with the money and, and, and they can take it to another way. But the problem is you take off the helmet, no one knows who you are. And it's so hard. Basketball players don't have that kind of thing. Baseball players don't have it. But football players have the hardest time because they are relegated to the fringes when they are done. You don't even know a guy's retired until like two or three years after he's gone. And it's so wild because I've always, I've talked to old players, I've talked to guys about making that transition, make, making sure your life is full of purpose and not just goals. Because when you try to just hit the goals, you get them or whatever, but you don't know what to do with yourself when it's over. Mm -hmm. And these guys, man, you gotta understand, I was on a, 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 a Charger team that has seen, uh, I'm, people who are my age, that there are over seven or eight guys who've passed away since I retired from playing football. And I'm talking about, I'm only 48 years old. Yeah. And I mean, died in terrible circumstances. Suicide, uh, drugs, different, different issues that never got resolved. And um, I'm really all about helping the players, man, and helping, because my heart is, you have to see how small an NFL career is. How small a sports career is. And everybody treats this thing like, uh, you, you drop a ball, you miss a pass, it's your whole life forever. You miss the kick, you miss the field goal, but your life keeps going. You know, and the thing that blew me away is when I went to Europe and I started trying to find NFL sports scores and couldn't find them. And I realized nobody <laughs> gave a Got damn it. all over the rest of the world. And I said, you know yeah. what? It put the thing in perspective yep. for me. And I was able to say, oh, wow, nobody real. It's not life or death. Mm -hmm. It's still fun. It's still a Terry, game. Terry, Terry, I'm sorry, man, I, I lost. Just, no, it's good. Okay. But still, I, I lost myself. Like, no, man, it's Molly, powerful. For a second. Yep. Molly, listen, guys, I, I know we got to go. Terry, man, I just wanted to say I'm proud of you, bro. You and Michael you. Strahan and what y'all are doing is special, my man. It's thank special. You. All the best to you, my man. Love you. Love you, Steven. Same here. Yes, you know thank it. you so much for being here. We're looking forward to another season of Brooklyn Nine-Nine as well, and we appreciate you, and, and we appreciate those words as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hope to see you again soon. Oh, you got it. Come to Lambeau, defeat the champions to become the champions. He'll give it to Adrian, who sprints up the middle, lowers the head, second effort to the goal line, a tough long touchdown. He'll loop it, it's incomplete, take it down. Rise, Minnesota, get up and salute the Vikings right now. Intercepted. it. Perfect feet, head five, touchdown. Looks to throw, steps up, heaves it deep down at the middle yes. of the field. It's incomplete. Minnesota Vikings are NFC North champions! We all remember that Week 17 game cost the Packers the division in a home game in the playoffs. Mike Zimmer is one of the rare few who have limited Aaron Rodgers' production. In six starts against Zimmer with the Bengals and the Vikings, of course, Rodgers has lower numbers in passing yards per game, yards per attempt, touchdowns per game, and passer rating while being sacked more frequently. Oh, Stephen A., does Zimmer have your boy's number?
Oh, please. Mm -hmm. Don't spit Did you just that see nonsense. that? Did you see that full that's screen? Just, that's, just, that's just an ignorant thing for people to say. Let's First of all, let's throw Cincinnati out the window. If you're playing against them continuously and he's the coordinator you're facing against, then that would be different. But the Cincinnati Bengals were in the, are in the AFC North. Green Bay's in the NFC North. There's only but so many times you're going to play against them. So lack of familiarity with a particular opponent, that's not something you throw into the equation in terms of who has your number. What we have to look at is what transpired since Zimmer has been the coach of the Minnesota Vikings. I recall Aaron Rodgers losing to them the last game of the regular season because only James Jones, he was the only receiver that ever showed up for the Green Bay Packers. Jordy Nelson was out all year injured. Randall Cobb, Richard Rodgers, and others simply couldn't Devontae Adams throw him into the equation, wouldn't show up, and Eddie Lacy was fat last year and needed to lose weight, so he wasn't himself, even though he did have a 100-yard rushing game against the Vikings, and he's rushed for 100 yards in four to six meetings that he's going against the Minnesota Vikings. But let's take into account consideration when we talk about Aaron Rodgers going up against the Minnesota Vikings, whether it's Zimmer or anybody else. Since 2010, what is his record against them? 10 and 2. What about the completion of passes he's registered? 69.2% of his passes, 29 touchdowns, four interceptions. That sounds like a man has your number. I mean, spare me. It's nothing to even think about here. Now that Jordy Nelson is back, even though he wasn't sensational last week, six receptions for just 32 yards, just averaging like five yards a catch, is far below what we expect from him. But when you think about a Richard Rodgers, when you think about a Randall Cobb, when you think about a Devontae Adams, when you think about the fact that Eddie Lacy is now in shape and expected to run the ball effectively, and you have your requisite weapons. We have to take that into consideration. We also have to remember that Aaron Rodgers was sacked just once last night, uh, last week. Whereas when he went against the Vikings and he lost, he was sacked five times. So it was constant pressure, primarily because he was holding on to the ball, primarily because of his receivers' and inability to get open. And so I don't anticipate that that is going to be a problem. And more importantly, I think he's going to have more opportunities to wreak havoc because I think with a new quarterback in play and Sam Bradford, because I'm expecting him to be in there instead of some dude named Sean Hill, okay? The fact of the matter is I think that D Green Bay's defense will be effective enough against Minnesota for Aaron Rodgers to get the ball more and have more opportunities to do damage. Minnesota's defense is really good. Zimmer is a damn good coach. But to say somebody has the number of that bad man, Aaron Rodgers, is utterly ludicrous. Nobody has the number of this dude right here because he's an absolute stud, the best in football as far as I'm concerned, and I anticipate that he will show it again this weekend. By the way, the game is indoors. It ain't in that fro no frozen temperatures of Minnesota like it was last year. This game is indoors. They're playing in the new stadium for the Minnesota Vikings, so no wind chill factors, no freezing temperatures, or all of that other stuff. These are going to be ideal conditions, which will work very, very well for somebody as lethal as that bad man known as Aaron Rodgers. I'm rolling with Green Bay, and, and Zimmer does not have his number because nobody has Aaron Rodgers' all number. All right, all right, all right. I'm ready to be ludicrous. But I'm going to stay on point. That's what you do in a debate. It's not whether or not Zimmer has the Packers number. So I don't know why you're bringing up how many times the Packers have beaten the Vikings. It's about whether or not he has Aaron Rodgers' number. And Molly gave you the stats. We put them up on the screen. I mean, I, you called stats and I guess facts ignorant. Completion percentage down, six points. Yards per game down, yards per attempt down, touchdown percentage down. Passer rating way down from 104 to 89 against Mike Zimmer. Now, you admit oh, last oh, no, year you, and then give me the stat. No, you you got a lot of excuses for him. I've never seen so many excuses for somebody. There's no excuse. Lack I don't have to make an excuse for somebody as great as him. Lack of familiarity. You listed off all the weapons that Aaron Rodgers has been missing. You even listed the temperature in Minnesota as problems for Aaron Rodgers. These are That's not a factor. I just I, you're really going out of your way to explain some stats. I mean, you've you I don't reached think it's everything going out from of your the way. weather to his to his his ball boy. You've grabbed everything to explain Man, away these walk, numbers. It's hard to walk outside in five to ten degree below 16. The, the, the temperatures, let alone play football. And then you're throwing a rock for crying How out loud. How many quarterbacks Damn, come into hurts. the Vikings? Do they all get the excuse or just Aaron Rodgers? Say what? Do all the quarterbacks that come to Minnesota get the excuse or just Aaron Rodgers? 
<laughs> well, you talk about all the quarterbacks making the excuse. Everybody but, but, that goes to Minnesota had to, under the old conditions, play under those conditions. I don't understand why Baird Rodgers gets this great. big caveat they for great. his numbers being down against Who Mike Zimmer. Who was great against Minnesota? Who was great against Minnesota in those temperatures? Who? Who are they? I don't, Who are these people? Is it the temperature, or which one are we going to focus on? The temperature or all the weapons around him that don't live up to their expectations? Both! Because we're talking about Aaron Rodgers, a Super Bowl champion, universally recognized don't as the best quarterback Don't forget lack of familiarity. Don't forget lack of familiarity, That's what we're talking about too. here. Yeah, all the excuses. Here's the problem ahead, with your Aaron Rodgers position, okay? Go ahead. You know, this morning you said to me something like this was blasphemy to consider that, that, that Mike Zimmer had Aaron Rodgers' number. I think it'd be blasphemy or sacrilege or something like that. Those were your words. It's blasphemy. It's blasphemy. There you that, go. We'll go with that. Thank you. Thank we'll go you. with that. I like that, actually. I like it a lot because I'm it has sure religious you do. You like connotations. A lot of I say. It has religious connotations. You know? It, 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 it reflects the opinion of someone who's, who's veered off into the realm of faith, who stopped asking critical questions, who just believes in Aaron Rodgers and helps, in fact, make up excuses for him when it doesn't actually look on paper like Aaron Rodgers can play up to his level, his normal great level, against Mike Zimmer. And by the way, while we're at it, it isn't just against Mike Zimmer. I don't know if you've noticed this. It's hard when you're all in like this. But over the last 12 months, Aaron Rodgers in general have been down over the past year. Now, I'm sure you have we to... We know why! Oh, I, I know, I know. We're going to get to your excuses. But let's, let's point it out. Again, completion percentage, five points down. Touchdown percentage down. Passer rating down again. Big, 104 to 92. It looks to me, you said nobody has Aaron Rodgers' number. It looks to me like a lot of people have Aaron Rodgers' number. That's your argument. That's your argument. That a lot of people... I Let lay out stats. I lay out facts. Okay, you lay me, out excuses, me. and you allow say, me. that's my argument. You know what the answer okay, is? Okay, yes, okay, that's my okay. argument. Uh, um, I applaud you. Your argument sounds good. I'm very touched. It's a rare moment. I'll give that to you. It sounds good. Let's go with this, okay? Aaron Rodgers struggled last year. We all recognize that. We've all lamented how the Aaron Rodgers that we saw last year is not the Aaron Rodgers that we know. We said, what happened to Aaron Rodgers? We pointed to Eddie Lacy being overweight. Here they come. We pointed to Mike McCarthy not doing the play calling, which he was back to doing this year. Because I, I, very, I think it was John Gruden pointed that out and how he likes that. We also pointed out there was an absence of Jordy Nelson, who only happens to be an all-pro receiver, by the way, and Aaron Rodgers' number one weapon. We talked about the development of Richard Rodgers because it wasn't there prior to last season, so you had to get that into, into the play. But anyway, let's just make this point. Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers had a down year last year. Fair enough, down year. 31 touchdowns, eight interceptions, quarterback rating of 92, QBR of 64, 10 and 6 record, completing 60.7% of his passes. That was a down year well, for Aaron Rodgers. The argument. Which tells you how great he is. That may because be. Because a down year for him is at least a decent year for most quarterbacks in the NFL. And by the way, he threw for 3,821 yards. That's a down year that for may Aaron be. Rodgers. That may be. And that would be a heck of an argument. If I were out here arguing that Aaron Rodgers is trash or that Aaron Rodgers isn't even a top five quarterback in the NFL, you might have hit one over the fence if that's what I was saying. Oh, but okay. what I'm saying is that it looks like Mike Zimmer has Aaron Rodgers' number. And layer on top of that, that Aaron Rodgers himself hasn't been playing up to his standards, his standards. But I just over gave you 16 year. games. And what you come out with when you look at the but numbers. But I just gave you 16 and games. And you look at Mike Zimmer as well. Yeah. You gave me 16, and that layer on top so of that. So you're talking Mike Zimmer. I'm talking about a season because of what he was working with. I feel you're like talking about one coordinator who happens to be a head coach now got his number. I'm saying they don't have anything to do with one individual. I feel like it you're has everything to do with now. what he had to work with last year. Mike Zimmer's been coaching against Aaron Rodgers for longer than one season. These numbers reflect more than two games. These numbers reflect a career against Aaron Rodgers. What this all adds up to, what this all adds up to is a Vikings win, by the way. A team, okay. by the way, that most people are sleeping on with Adrian Peterson and one of the best defenses in the league and Sam Bradford, hopefully, this Sunday. Playing. I'll give you this. I'll give you this. Your argument is successful enough in this respect. You've annoyed me with how ignorant it is to question the greatness of Aaron Rodgers that I'm tempted to have you back on. I, I will tell you <laughs> that that's work. That's getting to me. I'll give you that. I'll now you that. know how I feel as a Cowboy fan. By the way, the Packers yeah. one of your teams, too? Let's talk about Aaron Rodgers. Oh, the, oh, the quarterbacks you have in oh, doubt. Oh, 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 oh,
Oh, did you hear that, Stephen A? What do you uh, say? What do you say? Are the Packers one of your teams too? It's hard to tell. I'm a Steelers fan, die hard, but I always root for the New York teams as well because I'm a native New Yorker. So I don't root against them unless they play for, against the Steelers. But I love my Steelers. I'm a diehard Steelers fan. Don't think I'm a Green Bay fan. Some people I have one wife. Aaron some people Rogers. have three. <laughs> I right. love me Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, no. We will Look at him. You guys Houston, just made Houston this game even more intriguing for me, just so you know. Oh, Houston. So, up next, the last time the Steelers and Bengals faced off Cincinnati's late game collapse in the playoffs allowed Pittsburgh to advance. What do the guys expect in the rematch Sunday? This is one of Stephen A's teams, in case you were concerned. <laughs> Mark Schlereth, the Super Bowl champ, he's here. Here's the snap. He's back. Throws the pass. It's complete. Antonio Brown up over the 50. And a first down to the 47. Then gets the shotgun snap. He throws the ball down the field. It's overthrown. Incomplete at the 34 yard line. over and threw a punch, guys. Guess what? Guess what? What an idiot. If that's a 15-yard penalty, kick the field goal and go to Denver. A 35-yard field goal with 18 seconds to go. Here's the kick by Boswell. It's on its way. It's up. It's good. The Pittsburgh Steelers forge ahead by a score of 18-16. to 16. The Bengals, they haven't won a playoff game in 25 years, and they cost themselves a playoff win due to penalties from Vontez Burfick and Adam Jones that set up the Steelers' game-winning field goal on that wild card weekend. The NFL says the officials calling the game will have heightened awareness coming into the game. Mark Schlereth here with us. How are we doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good to see you, as always. We're putting someone on notice here. Obviously, the officials already have been put on notice, but are you putting the officials or Marvin Lewis? Stephen A., let's start with uh -huh. you. He's calling for it. Mark Schlereth, I threw out this question. Uh, Will Kane is not to be held accountable for this. He doesn't need any more pressure added to his shoulders. Uh, so I'll do that myself. Uh, what I will tell you, however, is that to me, it's not the officials that should be put on notice. It's Marvin Lewis. The Cincinnati Bengals have made the playoffs about seven or eight times in his career. I think he's entering his 13th season, it's either 13th or his 14th season. But he's made 14th, the playoffs about Stephen a. his 14th yep. season. He's made the playoffs, I think, I think about seven or eight times. He has not won a single playoff game in 13 complete seasons as the head coach of this franchise. And the reason that I said that the question is appropriate as it pertains to Marvin Lewis is because even though they win during the regular season, the fact that they didn't win the playoff game last year against the Pittsburgh Steelers is the most horrid moment of Marvin Lewis's career. And here is why, Schlereth and Kane. Because how is it that you lose that game? Because of a lack of discipline. Because your players couldn't control themselves in key pivotal moments emotionally. Now, I don't hold Pac-Man Jones that accountable for it. Because even though I like Joey Porter a lot, Joey Porter coming out on the field supposedly to check on Antonio Brown still said something to Pac-Man Jones, which prompted Pac-Man Jones to get into his face and get an additional penalty, which puts the, put the Steelers' field goal kick in position to win the game. But Vontez Burfick, who will not be playing in this game, by the way, due to his three-game suspension, we must take into account the fact that Marvin Lewis is the coach of this franchise. He also, I'm going to go here, he also happens to be an African-American coach. And we know how challenging, at least it was at one time, for African Americans to get these opportunities to be a coach. And it's because people are questioning your ability to be leaders of men, which is one of the reasons why I'm so quick to hold black players accountable when they act up on the watch of African American coaches because you know what challenges it is that they face in order to get these opportunities. And when they get these opportunities, you got to make sure you protect them, not just by going all out and performing to the best of your ability, which you should be doing for any coach, no matter who it is, what his ethnicity is, but you should also be doing it from a disciplinarian standpoint because you don't want to give the impression ever, especially with an African-American coach, that the players are running the asylum and there's no structure, there's no order, there's no control. And I bring that up because that's what resonated with me when I watched the Cincinnati Bengals literally come apart on national television last year, 
against the Pittsburgh Steelers. It really bothered me that there was such an absence of self-control. And with Marvin Lewis doing all the losing in the postseason that he's been losing, to lose that game like they did, strictly due to discipline, to me it ain't about the officiating. It ain't about how physical this, 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 this uh, matchup is going to be. It's not about how, how vicious this rivalry is. It's about a coach in Marvin Lewis that needs to show through his players that he is indeed in control. That's what I need to see in a rivalry this heated. And it's from Marvin Lewis because I certainly ain't worried about that with Mike Tomlin. So here's a couple of different things. One, I do believe that it's up to the officials to set a tone early. Make sure that you understand as players what you're going to allow and what you are not going to allow because that ultimately goes to the officials. That's their responsibility. And you go back to the opening game Thursday night, had the very first launching penalty, Brandon Marshall on Cam Newton been called, that game would have been officiated differently or played by the players differently. As a player, if you allow me to hold you and the official's not going to call it, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to undress you on every single play because if you're allowing me to do it, I'm going to push the envelope very much like a pitcher. I'll give you Greg Maddox. He's going to start on the black, right? It's called the strike. All right, let me go an inch outside the black. It's called the strike. All right, let me go two inches outside the black. It's called the strike. Let me go three. Called the strike. Let me go four. Okay, that one's a ball. All right, I'm going to stay at three inches, and you need a telephone bat or a telephone pole to hit it. You know, I mean, I'm going to get out there, and I'm going to use whatever that official or whatever that umpire is going to allow me to use. That's football, so that's on the officials. So they do have to do a good job of setting the standard, setting the tone of how this game is going to be officiated, and they need to set that early so that the players understand what's going on. As far as Marvin Lewis is concerned, I'm with you, Stephen, in this. As Coach Herm Edwards always says, you're either coaching it or you're allowing it to happen. And whether you're coaching it or you're allowing it, both of those things are just good enough to get most coaches fired. Because you cannot, in this league, with a talent that is so close, you cannot allow your team to cost itself games because you are undisciplined. Rex Ryan, there is nobody on a hotter seat than Rex Ryan. Last night, Thursday night football, they get in an opportunity where they are close to winning a football game. They have, ultimately, they have a bunch of penalties. You know, and those things end up costing you games. And ultimately, you put the point of onus to, to Rex or to Marvin and say, your team doesn't play disciplined football enough, especially in crunch time, to be a contender. And that's a real issue. You, ne you almost knocked it out of the park. I mean, okay. 100%. Oh. I almost didn't need to make a single argument because you nailed baseball strike zone. The Who the hell are you, Simon Cowell? <laughs> I mean, right. what, what, what do you mean he almost, right. he almost right. knocked it That's out right. of the park? Are you, ju you judge and jury with everybody now? He's I the, mean, you're he's a the guest. Roger, he's the Roger you Goodell of this show. <laughs> judge, know, jury, what do you think? You're, you're, you're a you guest, man. You're a guest, man. I don't know what you mean about now. The, it's the way it's always been. You just didn't know. Come here. Come here. up. Go ahead. Continue. You are right about it being on the officials. So Stephen A's wrong. The onus is on the officials tomorrow night. They set the tone. It's their fault Cam got hit four times in the head on opening night. You flagged that penalty the first time. It doesn't happen three more times. It's not just sports, by the way. It's not just baseball. It's anything in life. You give an inch, somebody takes a yard. It's the reason people don't pay taxes in Greece or Italy, because they don't know if they have to. If the rules are in place, then they will follow the rules. Set the rules early. But here's where, I, this is why I said you almost hit the part. The whole thing about Marvin Lewis and discipline and whether or not Marvin Lewis should be responsible for this discipline, the, the, did you see the movie Black Mass? Johnny Depp plays Whitey Bulger. The I, Boston I, I know of it. I have that not watched it. That was a great movie. It was that a was good a great movie. movie. There's a I moment, really liked it. There's a yeah. moment where Whitey Bulger is sitting there talking to his son. He said, son, it's not what you do. It's where you do it, who you do it to. He said, if nobody ever sees it, then it didn't happen. Of course, it's immoral, but it's true. And that's what the Steelers got away with. Joey Porter on that field deserves to be flagged. You'd be having the same conversation today if the mm -hmm. officials had played that right. But you'd be having it about Mike Tomlin instead of Marvin Lewis. The only difference between Marvin Lewis and Mike Tomlin in that game, that particular game, is that Marvin Lewis's team got caught. That's it. Okay. Right, but, Mar right, but, Marvin, but Marvin Lewis's <laughs> team reacted. 
Yeah, Marvin Lewis's sorry. team didn't have the maturity to stand <laughs> back and go, what's this coach well, doing on the field? They're that, reacting, there's punches being thrown, and there's and there's language Mark, being Mark. used. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> All right. Let me get him. Okay. <laughs> let, let me let me let me tell you something, Will Kane. Yeah. You can sit up there and point all you want to about how the Steelers didn't get caught and the Bengals got caught. But it was the Bengals that walked in there knowing Marvin Lewis's history. It was the Bengals that walked in there because even though he ended up keeping his job, remember, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, there was some trepidation about the future and speculation about the future of Marvin Lewis. Because it had been 12 complete seasons or 13 complete seasons, and there had still not been one single playoff victory. Because he was 0-7 in his playoff career and coaching in the postseason as a head coach. Because of all of those things, they knew what kind of tenuous situation Marvin Lewis was in. They had the lead. They came back from a deficit. They took the lead. The game was in their hands. You had Vontez Burfick, who not only sacked Ben Roethlisberger, but then cheated because he was on the ground and was kneeing him in the ribs and stuff like that and got away with it. You had a, either a fumble or interception. Forgive me if I, I don't recall what the play was. And then they ran into the tunnel like they had won the game. But ultimately, the Steelers, they've come back. There were several instances, correct me if I'm wrong, Slareth, where there was... So much emotion that the Cincinnati Bengals seemed like they were be, they they were ex, uh, just ex, uh, displaying a little a, a little lack of control, a little bit too much excessiveness leading up to that final drive. The so there were there were remnants of incidences, Will, where you didn't have an excuse for conducting yourself that way, and it was a perfect opportunity for Marvin Lewis to reel dudes in to let them know there was still time on the clock. We still got a game to win here, and he had no control to the point where there was literally footage of him while Vontez Burfick and others were losing control where he's sitting there just looking around as opposed to getting in God's face and, and telling them to calm the hell down and do what they were supposed to do. Think about that. That's not about, let, that's not about Tomlin. That's about Marvin Lewis. Well, let's talk about perspective really quick, and mm -hmm. let me give you this perspective, okay? Narratives change based upon perspective. When you win, you get the benefit of the doubt, right? Joey Porter's on the field. Nobody talks about it. Remember that Ravens game? It was a Sunday night game, I believe. Jacoby Jones taking it to the house. Yep. Mike Tomlin steps on the field to yes. impede the well, progress. But when you win, and when you win in the playoffs, you know what? It's gamesmanship. All that proves is Whitey Bulger was <laughs> right. right. <laughs> He's 100% right. That was a great when lesson you, for the When Kings you earlier. lose... When you lose, well, you have a lack of discipline. You know what? When Rex Ryan is winning, it's exciting. He's bombastic, right? He's a guy that's going to bloviate, and it's fun, and it's good for the game. When you're losing, you are a blowhard, and guess what? That that stuff doesn't work. So my, that my really becomes. Can my, say, only, you're right, my, Mark. Only challenge, you're right. Mark, my only challenge, yeah. Mark, my only challenge with that particular statement is that you mentioned winning, and you talked to Will. You should have turned to me. Oh. Will knows nothing about winning. Don't, 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 don't kiss up to that. Oh, Sorry. Okay. He knows nothing about winning. That's all I, that's all, that, that, that's that's all I would tell you about that. He knows nothing about I'm trying to make a point to okay. your counterpoint okay. here. I understand. Yeah, you yeah. tried yeah. to help him. Yeah. Right. You tried to help him. What about staying even? We don't get too high or get too low. We stay cool. Mark, thank you. Always good to see you. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. The national anthem protests continue around the world of sports, but someone here says politics and sports don't mix. Find out who. When we come back, I have a feeling this conversation is going to be fun. Back in July, the NBA announced that they were moving the NBA All-Star Game out of North Carolina because of the HB2 law, which is controversial bill that limits protection of the LGBT community. On Wednesday, the ACC announced they are moving the neutral site conference championships out of the state as well. Here's what Panthers coach Ron Rivera had to say about his thoughts on this yesterday. People come to the stadium to get a weapon. You know, um, and I decided that after the 1980 Olympic boycott, I didn't think it was fair. We were using sports as pawns. You know, we weren't happy with the politics in, in Russia. And what did they do? They were invading Afghanistan. So as far as I'm concerned, sports is sports and politics is politics. You want to talk politics, you want to get involved, tell you that in the political ring, you want to make change, vote. Well, you agree with Ron Rivera there? Yeah, I do agree with Ron Rivera. Now, to some extent, I recognize that 
politics and sports intermingling, at least on the edges, is unavoidable. It happens. Politics seeps into every aspect of life, no matter where you're looking, pop culture, sports, whatever. But at this point, we've gotten pretty far beyond the messy edges of sports and politics um, intermingling, Stephen A. What we've gone into is advocacy. We've been, what we've gone into is sports entities, sports franchises, players advocating for positions through the mechanism of sports. And here's why I have a problem with that. It's all cool. Everyone likes it as long as you agree with it. And then, oh boy, the game changes. Everyone can root on a player or a team or the NCAA or the NBA doing something as long as it's on their side. Now, it reflects this larger problem we have, by the way, where only, everyone only wants to hear people that agree with them. They can't expose themselves potentially to the idea that they could be wrong. And by the way, when I look at people like that, I see lazy, I see sloppy, I see easy win. And it's not just win like, oh, you know, debate, cheap wins and losses. It's, it's like easy persuasion to my side. If I have a position, if I encounter someone, and by the way, Stephen A, just to say, you're not one of these people. Consistently subjected his views to scrutiny, to rebuttal. It makes your argument better, it makes your position better, it makes you better. But now we're in this world where everyone agrees all the time, only wants to hear from people they agree with. And here's how this comes back to the NCAA and the NBA. You get into an idea where anyone that disagrees with you, well, they can't have a legitimate point, and they can't simply even be wrong. They gotta be evil. They gotta be bigots. They gotta be racists. They gotta be awful human beings, because otherwise they'd be on my side. Clearly, right? That's what everybody thinks. So now when I see the NCAA or the NBA or anyone taking political positions, what they've done is they've ignored the potential for real disagreement. And by the way, most athletes, most sports entities are completely unqualified to have informed opinions on any of these debates, much less recognize intelligent disagreement. So this is my problem with it. It reduces us into good guys versus bad guys. Let's advocate for the good guy's side. And it all works as long as you think you're on the good guy's side. Well, first of all, let me say a couple of things. <clears throat> and I know we're debating on this show. Let me say something to you personally, Will. Um, there is very little that you say that I agree with. But I love having you on this show. I love having you on the show today. I think you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm proud of the, uh, of the job that you're doing here, filling in for Max today. And you're always welcome Thank on you. this Thank show. You. Thank you. And I sincerely mean that because the fact of the matter is, you're right when you talk about how people react to opinions that are different than their own. And you made that point on Twitter over a week ago. And you were absolutely right about that. I don't think that your opinions that are different than mine make you evil. I don't think it makes you bad. I certainly don't think it makes you a racist or a bigot. I think it makes you who you are, which is a person with your views who comes from a different culture, a different background than me, and you don't view it the same way, which you have every right to do. I want to make sure that I'm very, very clear about that. But here's where I would say to you I disagree with you as it pertains to Ron Rivera and talking about sports and politics don't mix. It absolutely does mix. It might be oil and water, but it's the kind of oil and water combination that you better find a way to make it a syrup or something. I don't know what the hell it could ultimately turn into, but you better find a way to do it because we as a society has spent far too much time intermingling it by putting an added amount of pressure on the athletes to be more than just athletes when it serves other folks' purpose. But then we want them to shut up when it serves theirs. It doesn't work that way because you know me well enough to know I'm about fairness. When we talk about Jackie Robinson integrating baseball, yes, he integrated baseball, but wasn't that about integration? That wasn't just about sports. It was about integration. And it was about getting ourselves and elevating ourselves as a society to a point where we became integrated and we accepted people who looked differently and were different than us and understanding that we were aspiring as a nation to be a gorgeous mosaic and it's what we all should be advocates of the civil rights movement and legislation no that didn't involve sports but to the degree it did because jim brown with muhammad ali with bill russell with kareem abdul jabbar lou alcinda at the time or, or the list goes on and on those people they were sports figures but if they did not take the positions that they took it may not have compelled society to pay attention, take notice, and feel compelled to act.
Kurt Flood, free agency, okay? That had an impact. Even though it was sports, it spoke to a bigger issue. And teams not having the right to own you just because they drafted you and completely control you. Spencer Haywood coming out of, 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 of high school and, and wanting to, to, you know, be in the ABA and then coming to the NBA and having to challenge the authority of the NBA to keep him restricted to the confines they wanted him restricted to. That spoke to bigger issues. So when we think about the bevy of issues that have permeated our society through the prism of sports, we have to understand it's not about sports. It's about life, American life, life in our society. Sports figures are just those, uh, you know, those, those figures that, that are illuminated before us. Why? Because we point at them the money that they've earned, the money generated by sports, especially in this day and age, and we have compelled them to be more than just athletes. We want you to be model citizens. We want you to be pitchmen. We want you to be the kind of individuals that to go to somebody's home on Thanksgiving or go to somebody's home on Christmas, the kind of person who's welcoming, the kind of person who's inviting. Think about society and how we've evolved. Think about gay rights. Think about the immigration issue. Think about a bevy of other things that have taken place in our society and how we've used sports to basically ingratiate those issues into the fabric of American culture. It may not have been successful, Will, had we not pulled no. that off. And that's where I disagree well, no, with I Ron Rivera. I d well, Go ahead. With Ron Rivera, but with you, I yes. don't wholeheartedly disagree. Sports has right. been a catalyst for many great social changes. You have okay. to understand, although you and I might be on the same side on many of what those social changes were, maybe all of them, perhaps there's people okay. who aren't. Right? Perhaps there are people that disagree with it. And all I'm saying on this is what you risk at some point is you take official positions. By the way, we're not just talking about the quiet dignity of Jackie Robinson here. We're talking about overt political positions, right? Here's where this league stands on this bill. And by the way, okay. for the record, no one knows where I stand on these bills. By the way, I left politics. You've referenced it several times to come over here and talk to sports. But sometimes I feel like I'm the only one. I feel like everyone wants to be a frustrated political pundit at every action. I can promise you this. That's right. I can You're right this. about that. Sports is better. So don't go over there because it's not everything you think it's cracked up to be. It's not enlightening. It's not, it's not even entertaining, much less is it helping the conversation. This, put, this sports conversation is better in almost every single way. Oh, but, I agree with you. But I just on this point, if sports is insistent on being overtly political, politically active, you're just going to be reminded at some point you're also a business. And there are people yeah. who don't want, I'm not talking about any particular thing. I'm not talking about Kaepernick. I'm not talking, about, but there are people who don't want their politics and sports mixed. And there'll be a market for those people. Mm -hmm. There'll be a market for you to turn and find just sports as an escape. But, 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 but the problem with it, Will, is this. Those same people then want to turn around and dictate what they do want you to get involved. No, that's right. Outside that's right. Of like I said, sports. it's always if you agree just, with it. Always if you I, agree. I'm just saying, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that if you're going, I, I would support that stance by Ron Rivera and yourself. If nobody bothered the athlete about anything other than playing and going home. And that's impossible. But when you want, but yeah. when you want to bother them about other things, you then can't turn around and try to say, well, this doesn't belong in sports. Because there's a lot of things that athletes mm -hmm. would prefer they didn't have to deal with, but they're compelled to by yeah. virtue of the fact that the money that they're making, they're considered role models, et cetera, et cetera. You can't have it both ways. You either got to let them in yeah. or not. It's Pandora's box. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I agree. And to your point right. earlier, whether we like it or not, it is a business at the end of the day and it comes down to the bottom line. People don't want it's that affected. Yep. Coming up next, Stephen A's boy, the Italian stallion, Jimmy G. He's looking for an encore performance. I'm oh watching Lord. Stephen A's face right now. Oh my After goodness. being the Cardinals in the desert last Sunday. But will the Dolphins get the best of the Pats quarterback? This is going to be good. Find out. I don't know you. Jimmy G off to a flying start after one game for the Patriots. He upset the Cardinals. A lot of people didn't think he'd win that one. His numbers in one game are better than Tom Brady's stats through the first two games in his career. How about them apples? Jimmy Garoppolo, as Stephen A calls him, completed one last pass. Has a higher completion percentage, higher passing yards, and more touchdowns. That was without Rob Gronkowski. Will Kane, what do you expect from the Italian Stallion? Please, can we not compare him to Brady? Please, not uh, yet. I expect this. Four quarterbacks made their first start this past weekend. Garoppolo, Wentz, Prescott, Simeon. I think three of them 
and Jimmy G being among them, the bloom will fall off the rose. There was an article this week up on The Ringer showing that everyone dinked and dunked the first week away. Every one of the passes were like six yards in the air. Some of them as short as four when it comes to Trevor Simeon. That's going to end. That's gonna, these players, as soon as defenses get a little more complex with these first-year starters, three of them are going to tail off, and Jimmy G is going to be one of them. The Dolphins are a team that people are sleeping on a lot, I think, like the Vikings. That defense holding the Seahawks in Seattle to 12 points, I am looking forward to see that Dolphins defense against Jimmy G. By the way, just so I don't leave you guessing, Stephen A., that one quarterback that's not going to turn, it's not going to wilt, that's Dak Prescott. It's just going to get sweeter as the season goes. So are you picking? What, what are you picking? You pick, Dolphins. What, what do you think is going to happen? The Dolphins, Dolphins going to win this game? Dolphins are going to win the game. Yes. Well, you know, listen, first of all, a couple of things. When you rock back and forth the way that you do in that chair, it, like just shows how, it just shows how nerv <laughs> it just shows how nervous you are. And, 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 and listen, we're just talking sports here. Will, there's no reason to get nervous. I mean, don't panic. All I'm going to do is, is expose you for being wrong. That's all I'm going to do. There's no harm that's going to come to you. It's the United States of America. You're just, free to be wrong with you all, all the time. Take your and this eyes is the latest you. example. This is the latest example because here's the reality. Did you see the Miami Dolphins offense last week? I did. Now, I understand it was against Seattle. I understand it was against the Legion of Boom, but... The bottom line is they've looked that way no matter who they've gone up against. Ryan Tannehill only threw for 186 yards. Arian Foster's their new running back. My brother, I love Arian Foster. But the guy only ran for 38 yards. Jarvis Landry had 10 receptions, but they were for 59 yards. I mean, the Miami Dolphins, their offense has looked discombobulated all, all through training camp, through preseason, and now into the regular season. I have no faith in them yet. I think Gase is the right man. I think he'll do a good job for them. But I think that I think that what we're trying to find out and discover here is how valuable and real and legitimate Ryan Tannehill is because he got the $95 million deal. Let's face reality, the people in South Beach don't believe in him. He looks the part, you know, handsome man, good-looking wife, seems like a family-oriented dude, really decent dude, looks like South Beach got the nice tan, the kind of tan Will Kane would have if he wasn't in Bristol all the damn time, if he was down in South Beach. But that adds absolutely, just like it has no substance to your argument, it adds no substance to his game. So in the end, what it comes down to, Will Kane, is that Ryan Tannehill and that Miami Dolphins offense is not going to be good enough. You look at Jimmy Garoppolo, not Jimmy G, Jimmy Garoppolo, it's really not that. I mean, it was an impressive performance, but 264 yards, a tad bit above pedestrian. He's working under the system of Bill Belichick. He'll be just fine. They'll run the ball with LeGarrette Blunt. He'll feed dudes like Martellus Bennett and Edelman and those, and those boys, and they'll do enough to win this game against an improved Miami Dolphins defense. But just like defense wins championships, points win games. And Miami ain't going to win too many of them because I don't expect them to score much. I think New England wins this game something along the lines of 23 to 14. Well, the odds on Stephen A. complimenting uh, my, Ryan Tannehill's looks over Jimmy G's were low. Like, that was that. That was not oh, the Jimmy shot Jimmy G's a good-looking guy. Well, that's what I mean, I'm, I'm saying I'm not, I'm week, not in right? the business of, hold it, I'm not in the business of complimenting how men look. You just I don't did. Roll, I don't roll like that. That's yeah. just not my style. But if you're a handsome dude, I got to give you credit where credit is due. I look at Tom Brady. I'm telling you right now, I see some of his outfits. I'm like, damn, I got to get one of those. I got to get that blaze. I got to get that suit. I mean, if you got it, you got it. I got to give you props. You understand? But it, 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 that's all it is. Just giving credit where credit's due. We appreciate that. Coming up after the break, Drew Brees and Eli Manning put on a show in the Superdome last season. You remember that? But which quarterback puts up big numbers at the Meadowlands on Sunday? Find out next. Fantasy owners, stay tuned. First Take is brought to you by Toyota. Let's go places. Going down the middle for the end zone. Touchdown, what a catch. Dwayne Harris, right side caught, need hit, and it's intercepted. Here come the Giants the other way. Jermaine McBride at the 20, at the 10, and he's in for the touchdown. Tied game with seconds to go. There's the placement, kick is up on its way, and it is good. The Saints have won it. Can anyone say shootout? Drew Brees and Eli Manning combined for 13 touchdown passes in last season's Week 8 Saints win, which according to Elias is an NFL record. So who has the bigger game in the rematch on Sunday, Brees or Eli? Stephen A., you're up. 
Oh, please. I mean, I, I think Breeze will have the bigger game in terms of numbers, but it's not going to make any difference. The Saints are definitely going to lose this game. It's horrific. It's pathetic. It's awful, as their defense has been over the last couple of years. Thanks again to Rob Ryan. Look at this. One game into the season, they're already the 29th-ranked defense. That's third worst in the NFL. They're second to last in yards allowed, giving up 486. They're, they're 26th against the pass and dead last against the run. This is this is this is the Saints. Please, Giants win this game. But Breeze is going to get well, his Thank numbers. you for making my argument for me. That's why Eli is going to have the bigger day. This is how rational I am. There's nothing in me as the Cowboy fan that wants to give anything to Eli. He has to take it. By the way, Breeze, good Austin, Texas guy. I, I want to give it to him. But the answer is Eli is going to have the bigger day, and here's why. This is this is this is embarrassing for the Saints. P.J. Williams will be in his second start ever. The other cornerbacks are two undrafted. I don't even know their name. Two undrafted rookies. That, on top of having the worst defense you just pointed out, Eli is going to eat this up. Now he's got three receivers, Odell, Sterling, Sharp. He's going to, this is going to be a bloodbath. It was 1,000 yards last year, 1,000 yards combined last year. This is going to well, be Eli would, with the bigger day. What I would like to say to you is I'm very, very proud of you, Will, because um, not only did you uh, come on the show and make a good contribution today, uh, but you're not shy about being taught and being given <laughs> lessons. I mean, you admit it to the public um, and just sitting up there and talking about how you didn't know about the corners. You didn't even know their names. This is These are the reasons why I'm here for you. Can you, you. name I mean, them? This, I, Can I'm, you name I'm them? proud of you. Well, who, who cares? Who cares? Uh, That's let me answer. say something about who this. The, the normal, very capable, very good host sitting here, Max Kellerman, has said several times, the great thing about debate is I'm right or I learned something. Most of the time That's I right. was right today. I'm glad you got this to learn is, something. You're brilliant because you know you're not. I'm proud. You guys are Way so profound just dropping knowledge on a Friday. Have a good weekend. See you Monday.